In the future, people will be reaping the benefits of the efforts that are underway today to go into low Earth orbit to operate the ISS or someday go beyond there. And we don't know what they are today, but the one thing that I'm sure of is that something more than just spaceflight itself will come out of it. For precisely 20 years now, the massive orbiting laboratory has constantly been home to humans. A lucky handful of Earthlings who at any given time venture into the topsy-turvy world of microgravity. But like the rest of us, the International Space Station is aging, and it can't stay in orbit on its own indefinitely. It needs a regular boost of fuel injection from visiting spacecraft. If those boosts stop or something else goes wrong, sooner or later, the lab will fall. So, how is the ISS was made, and will there be an end to it? What will replace the ISS? Before we begin, make sure to smash the like button. Subscribe to our channel and click the notification bell for more amazing videos. The U.S. government tracks about 8,000 baseball-sized or bigger objects in low Earth orbit, a zone within a few hundred miles above the planet's surface. Most are pieces of used rockets and dead satellites, but more than 500 are functional spacecraft. Planning the space station began in the 1980s, and while today the concept of a massive orbiting laboratory is unremarkable, at the time it was unprecedented. No one had any idea how to build something like this when we started out on the ISS. Christian Maynard, director of in-space manufacturing and research for Houston-based company Axiom, which is planning on building its own space station by jumping off the International Space Station, told Space.com. We built the largest peacetime engineering project ever, and by building pieces of an overall spacecraft that never actually saw each other or touched each other until they got to orbit. All told, space station construction required 42 separate launches. The facility would weigh over 900,000 pounds, 420,000 kilograms on Earth, is near the length of a football field and boasts as much livable volume as a six-bedroom house, according to NASA. It's big. The station's demise didn't go completely unconsidered as the facility was being designed. Just a few years earlier, in 1979, NASA's Skylab station fell out of orbit. The agency had planned to guide the facility down to a controlled destruction in Earth's atmosphere using an early flight of the space shuttle, but that vehicle was delayed, leaving the 80-ton Skylab stranded even as solar activity picked up, warmed and expanded Earth's atmosphere, and thereby accelerated the facility's doom. As a result, the spacecraft fell on its own, out of control, leaving no way for NASA to target the pieces over remote areas or slow the spacecraft's descent enough to reduce the size of those pieces. Instead, chunks of the station scattered across Australia, the largest of them a massive oxygen tank. The incident was a turning point in how people think about how large objects leave orbit. In the early days of the space age, no one worried about it. Big things falling out of the sky? No big whoop, McDowell said. People have gotten more and more risk adverse over the years, and the longer space flight continues, the more experts worry about abandoned orbital debris, particularly the largest of it. The risk if the space station does fall to the Earth on its own is significant, McDowell argued. At about 400 tons, the space station is by far the heaviest human-made object ever to circle Earth. The larger an object is, the less likely the atmosphere is to be able to fully burn it up. And because of the space station's outstretched solar arrays, it's vulnerable to spinning out of control, at which point rescue options would be limited, McDowell said. No matter what led to an uncontrolled entry, the results would be pretty, he said. Although not nuclear catastrophe level grim, it would be more like a plane crash, although with debris spread over a much broader area. Worse. Worst case, I guess it's a 9-11, right? McDowell said, because it's the worst a plane crashing part of which in a populated area. And that's bad, but it's not asteroid hit bad. What will happen to the ISS in the near future? Officially, NASA, Ross Cosmos, and partners in Japan, Europe, and Canada have agreed to keep the station operational until at least 2020, but that's only half the story, said NASA spokesman Joshua Buck. The international partners have been discussing extending the mission through 2028. At this point, there's no reason we wouldn't do that. Still, at some point, the mission will end, and the orbiting laboratory will be directed to plunge towards Earth. The station can't simply be left in orbit, or it will eventually fall from the skies on its own, raining debris over a wide swath of the planet and possibly endangering people on the ground. The eventual destiny of the house station has all the time been a specter for NASA and Roscosmos, Russia's federal house company. However, as time has passed, it has loomed bigger on the minds of house consultants. Oh, we'll carry it down finally, the concept has all the time been. We decided to deorbiting it. However, my sense is that they did not truly assume by the main points till about five years in the past, McDowell mentioned. Till then it was like, la 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 la, it is in orbit. We're nonetheless constructing it. We're not gonna fret about easy methods to eliminate, which perhaps is not fairly the way in which you must do issues. To stay in orbit, 
an object must be traveling at a constant speed over Earth's surface. For the ISS, which orbits at a height of about 200 miles, 322 kilometers, that's roughly 17,500 miles, 20,163 kilometers an hour. The low Earth orbit is in a perfect vacuum. A whisper-thin veil of molecules at the atmosphere's outer reaches bumps into and slows down orbiting objects. You can't just leave something you want up there or you'll lose it. It's going to require boosting, said aerospace engineer and re-entry specialist William Ayler of the Aerospace Corporation, a federally funded research and development center based in El Segundo, California. The ISS weighs roughly 920,000 pounds, 417,305 kilograms, and spreads out over the air of the size of an NFL football field. To counteract its orbital drag, mission controllers must use propellant in attached spacecraft to periodically loft the station to a higher orbit. Without those propellant burns, the station would eventually drop from orbit. But it's not practical to let the propellant simply run out. The ISS won't be completely destroyed by atmosphere re-entry, and unless it's brought down intentionally, no one would know when or where chunks of debris would reach Earth. To keep people on the ground safe, it's best to deorbit a space station with a strong burn of propellant to slow it down at the right time. That's when Roscosmos did for Mir, which, prior to the ISS, was the biggest human-made object in space. The 145-ton Russian space station zoomed around Earth until March 2001, when Roscosmos slowed Mir down so that it broke up over the South Pacific Ocean at a location called Spacecraft Cemetery, a spot known for its remoteness from civilization. The International Space Station's successor may face a much smoother retirement, although still a fiery one. Texas-based Axiom Space is planning to launch new station modules and, as commercial interest in accessing orbit grows and the ISS ages, eventually split off from the International Space Station to form its own free-flying orbital facility. But Axiom has learned from the space station's complicated fate and has already wrestled with how its facility will end. The company is planning its modules to be more truly modular than those on the space station, with the capability to easily remove and replace segments anyway, giving the company flexibility in its future. The arrangement also means that each module can control its own fate. Each module is going to be designed with its own guidance, navigation, and control, its own thrusters, capabilities, Meander said, so they can fly essentially on their own, and then when they need to, they can separate and return through Earth's atmosphere on their own.